Lee Shire is a journalist, a researcher, an educator, and a playwright. He's originally from New York. He moved to Chicago in 87. And as a journalist, he wrote many stories for the Chicago Tribune, mostly for the Sunday Magazine, including many long feature cover stories. I think he enjoys the research and the, the documenting that goes along with his work. He, he also wrote for Chicago Magazine and other publications. His play Transfer Transference was produced at the Mercury Theater here in town. And he has just finished a musical, Myth America, working with a talented composer and lyricist. So that should be fun. From his journalism work, he developed a love of research and stories, which has led to this work as a lecturer. He spoke to us in January on the history of the eugenics movement in the United States. We welcome Lee Shire. Lee, turning it over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Peg. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here to talk to you at the Lakeshore Unitarian Society. I, admire your values and principles. I think that uh, this talk will give us a lot of grounds for some lively discussion. It's a political talk and politics have never been more polarized in our country. People have very strong feelings one way or another. Um, personal disclosure, my politics are to the left, but you know, in terms of a personal bias regarding the Koch brothers, uh, people with left-wing ideology uh, would show a great concern for uh, what they've done over the last 50 years. But if uh, you have a conservative ideology, there's a lot to be proud of in terms of what they've accomplished. So it, I guess it depends on where you stand. I notice in your principles, um, number five, um, the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large. And number six, the goal of the world community with peace, liberty, and justice. So I think that's a good entree into our discussion, whether the Koch brothers our enhancing our democracy? Are they uh, enhancing justice or, or are they uh, you know, working against it? So without further ado, I'm gonna get into giving you a nice uh, rich uh, evocation of Charles and David Coke, who they are and their 50 year quest to turn America to the right. Uh, David passed away recently, so I will probably speak about him as though he's alive, but he did recently pass away. So I'm also going to be talking about their colleagues, their like-minded billionaire uh, colleagues who are in their network. So we're going to be really talking about the Koch brothers and the Koch brothers network. So to understand Charles and David Koch better, it's good to start with their father, Fred Koch Sr. Now, Fred was born in Texas in the year 1900, and he earned a degree in chemical engineering from MIT. And he invented a process to in, improve the extraction of gasoline from oil. And Fred Koch became extremely wealthy. Now Fred and his wife Mary, they had four sons, Frederick Jr., Charles, and the twins, David and William. Fred was a very demanding father. He hated the idea that his sons might become what he called country club bums. So he pushed them very hard. He made them dig ditches on the family ranch and he was a tough disciplinarian and it was not beyond him to use a belt or even whip them to discipline them. So this was the kind of childhood 
milieu that Charles and David Koch grew up in. Now, in 1936, when all four of the boys were between three and five years of age, Fred wrote a letter to each of them. And he gave them each, it was the same letter. And it said, when you become 21, you will receive a large sum of money. It may be a blessing or a curse. You can use it as a tool for accomplishment or you can squander it foolishly. I know you're not going to let me down. And to this day, Charles Koch has that letter framed on his desk. Now, Fred Sr. indoctrinated his sons into the idea that big government and government controls were extremely bad. In 1958, as a matter of fact, Fred Sr. would become one of the founding members of the John Birch Society. And his sons were so influenced by him that Charles and David also joined the John Birch Society. Now, Charles went to MIT. He got a bachelor's degree in engineering. He then got a master's degree in nuclear engineering. He then got a master's degree in chemical engineering. And then he returned to Wichita, where the family lived, to start working in the family business. He lives there to this day. So Charles lives in Wichita, and uh, he's 86. As I said, David passed away this year. Frederick had passed away a couple of years ago. So it's just. Uh, William and Charles who are alive. Now, when Charles got home from college, he attended a private school called the Freedom School that had been founded by a gentleman named Robert Lefebvre in 1957, taking courses on subjects the philosophy of freedom, free enterprise, and the like. Lefebvre said, this was a quote from Lefebvre, government is a disease masquerading as its own cure. So here was this revulsion against government that Charles was becoming indoctrinated into as an extension of what he had learned from his father. The Freedom School's philosophy, listen to this, was that a nation should have no government. It should not therefore support a police or a fire department. There should be no compulsory taxes. There should be no government support of public schools, no health or zoning laws, not even money for national defense. So these are ex very extreme views, and they transformed the life of Charles Koch, who seemed to resonate with these ideas. It was at the Freedom School that Charles became acquainted with the work of two Austrian economists, Ludwig von Mises and his star pupil Friedrich Hayek, whose book, The Road to Serfdom, would become the Bible of conservatives. Hayek won the Nobel Prize for Economics in 1974. Hayek touted free markets as the key to all human freedom. He said government was coercive. Charles said, quote, I became committed to the idea of liberty as the form of social organization most in harmony with reality and with man's nature. So some kind of heavy concepts there. After reading von Mises and Hayek, Charles said, market principles have changed my life and guide everything I do now. Well, Fred Sr. passed away in 1967 and Charles, now 32, became chairman and CEO of Coke Industries. The family business, which was 
and still is and always has been a privately held company. Now, the crown jewel back then of the business was the Pine Bend Refinery, which made Coke Industries the world's largest exporter of oil out of Canada. Bill and David joined the company. Then Bill and Fred tried to wrest control of the company from Charles, but failed, and Bill was fired. And then Bill and Fred sued Charles and David, who bought them out for $1.1 billion. Although the litigation continued on for 17 years, creating much bad blood in the family. After getting his share of the buyout, $550 million, Bill founded his own energy company called Oxbow and became a billionaire in his own right. And he lived lavishly and barely spoke to Charles for decades. Bill's yacht won the prestigious America's Cup race in 1992. Fred Jr. was entirely engaged in the arts. He moved to Europe and lived there for the rest of his life. Um, he never got involved with the business or engineering at all. So Charles was now the undisputed chairman and CEO and David who lived in Manhattan was the executive vice president of Coke Industries and the CEO of its chemical technology group. Charles and David Koch would become the primary underwriters of hardline libertarian politics in America. Charles's aim was, as he said, to tear the government out at the root. So in 1975, Charles realized he needed a movement to spread his conservative and libertarian ideas. And he believed he had to get through to the younger generation through educational indoctrination. He felt his right-wing philosophy was marginalized in the US and his goal was to get it to become mainstream. So to that end, in the early mid 1970s, Charles Koch set forth to turn America to the right with an organized and methodical program that has been going on for at least 45, closer to 50 years. Now, his persistence and his or organization includes two donor summits a year and network national summit meetings where money is raised and strategies are planned. And this, as I said, has been ongoing for at least 45 years. Now, one of the members of Koch's network was a man named Richard Mellon Scape. He was born in Pittsburgh in 1932. His great uncle, Andrew Mellon, was the tre treasury secretary under Presidents Harding, Coolidge, and Hoover. And his mother was the granddaughter of Thomas Mellon, founder of the Mellon Bank of Pittsburgh, which eventually bought out Gulf Oil and Alcoa Aluminum. Richard Mellon Scape had a drinking problem. He was expelled from Yale for drunkenness. And he graduated from the University of Pittsburgh and went to work for the family business Gulf Oil. And when his father died in 1958, Richard, now 26, took over the family's finances. And he put all the scape money into charitable trusts. The yearly interest from these trusts had to be given to charity for 20 years, but then 
the trust could be passed on with no inheritance tax. It would be this tax law that would spur the founding of the modern conservative movement. What the Cokes and the Scapes came to figure out was that if they formed these private foundations and then donated to them, they could get these huge tax deductions and keep control of how the charitable funds were spent. Now, Lewis Powell was an eminent corporate lawyer from Richmond who would eventually become a Supreme Court justice. But at that time, he wanted to counter the liberal establishment. And he wrote a 5,000 word memorandum entitled Attack on the American Free Enterprise System. And it was a blueprint for a conservative takeover. Back then, corporations were reeling from the creation of the EPA and OSHA and the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and all the acts that created this new regulatory state in America. The tobacco industry was under heavy attack and in turmoil. Powell called on corporate America to fight back. They must capture public opinion by influencing the institutions that shape it. I'm gonna repeat that because this is so key. Capture public opinion by influencing the institutions that shape it. Public opinion is pretty much everything. And if you can capture it, you can alter the way Americans think. Powell wanted balance in textbooks. He wanted balance in TV news and in the university's faculty and curriculum. His memo electrified the right to fight a multi-war, multi-front war of influence over American political thought. Now, Richard Scaife emerged as the leading source at that time for funds helping to bankroll 133 of the movement's 300 most important institutions, many of them think tanks. Scaife founded the Heritage Foundation. By 1998, he had given $23 million to it. He was also the largest donor to the American Enterprise Institute. Now, the goal of these foundations was to create right-wing policy and then actively lobby members of Congress to use their policies and enact them into law. These new think tanks would be engaged in selling prepackaged, predetermined right-wing ideology to politicians. These new think tanks introduced doubt into settled scholarship and offered conflicting statistics and arguments from which to choose. Charles Koch too was galvanized by Lewis Powell's memorandum and he set up his own think tank, the Cato Institute. He gave $20 million to it. And of course we know his goals were and always will be lower taxes, less regulations, and fewer government programs for the poor and middle class. In 1980, Ronald Reagan, a conservative, was elected president. He embraced the Heritage Foundation's policy playbook, which was called Mandate for Leadership. This playbook laid out 1,270 conservative policy proposals and Reagan adopted 61% of them. He slashed individual and corporate taxes, cutting them from 70 to 28%, pretty drastic. Now, another member of the Koch network is John M. Olin, and you'll see how influential he was. He would be the first in the network to bring the conservative 
agenda to the university. So if we think that universities are kind of liberal leaning places where young idealistic kids go off to, uh, you know, ponder the ideas of improving the world. I think what we're gonna see here is that it really isn't so anymore. There's been so much money, conservative money pumped into universities that it seems that they're more right wing at this point. The Olin Foundation had been started in 19, 1892 by Olin's father in East Alton, Illinois as a manufacturer of blasting powder for coal miners. But they then um, bought the Matheson Chemical Corporation in 1954. And then they bought Squibb Pharmaceuticals and Winchester Rifles. John M. Owen had graduated from Cornell University. He donated huge amounts of money to his alma mater and six buildings on Cornell's campus are named after him, including the venerable main library, the Olin Library. Now, Olin had read Professor Hayek's essay, The Intellectuals and Socialism, in which Hayek had said, quote, to conquer politics, one must first conquer the intellectual. And Olin took it to heart. And so to conquer the intellectuals in the year 2000, the Olin Foundation funded Princeton's Madison program with $525,000 in startup grants. To conquer the intellectuals, the Olin Foundation funded William F. Buckley's TV show, Firing Line. To conquer the intellectuals, the Olin Foundation gave $33 million to Harvard's program on constitutional government, which emphasized a conservative interpretation of American government. So you can see as you start changing the thinking, how it starts to grow and expand across the country. Between 1999 and 2001, 56 of the 88 Olin Fellows at Harvard continued on to teach at the University of Chicago, Cornell, Dartmouth, Georgetown, Harvard, MIT, University of Pennsylvania, and Yale, spreading the conservative gospel across America. The Olin Foundation went on to support 11 separate programs just at Harvard alone. So you can see this infiltration of universities and intellectual thinkers, the significance of it. However, Olin believed that his most significant infiltration would be in to America's law schools. And to that end, he created programs that were called the Law and Economics Programs. And they were conservative analysis of laws. And I think the money was so big that universities were uh, eager to grab it. Uh, in 1985, Harvard took 18 million from the Olin Foundation to start the John M. Olin Center for Law, Economics, and Business at Harvard Law School. By 1990, 80 law schools taught his law and economics subject, and the Olin Fellows started winning Supreme Court clerkships. So again, you see the movement of these ideas into important institutions. The Olin Foundation also provided funding for the Federalist Society, the Organization for Conservative Law Students, that grew to 42,000 right-leaning lawyers on 150 law school campuses. So the, uh, the reach of the Koch brothers network was amazing. John M. Olin passed away in 1982 at the age of 
89. Now in the year 2004, Coke Industries, which I told you was, is a privately held company. It bought DuPont Synthetic Textile Division, the producers of Lycra and Stain Master Carpet. In 2005, they bought Georgia Pacific, the world's biggest manufacturer of plywood. It bought Dixie Cup, it bought brawny paper towels, it bought quilted northern toilet paper. By 2006, Coke Industries was grossing $90 billion a year. And like I said, privately held company owned by only two people, Charles and David Coke. Charles and David, hold on to your seats when I tell you this, gave themselves each a yearly salary of one billion dollars a year. That's kind of hard to wrap your head around. <laughs> yearly income of one billion dollars. That has nothing to do with their stock ownership and their net worth. Uh, today, Coke Industries does about $125 billion <clears throat> worth of business. As I said, David has passed away, so Charles is the sole owner, and Fortune Magazine puts them at seventh uh, richest people in the world at about $60 or $70 billion each. Now, a man named Richard Fink had become Charles Koch's new lieutenant. He had a three-phase takeover plan of American politics. Phase one, invest in intellectuals who ideas would, whose ideas would be raw products. Phase two, invest in think tanks that would turn these ideas into marketable policies. Phase three, subsidize citizens groups that would pressure elected officials to implement the policies. And so, Richard Fink and Charles Koch set forth to put these into practice. In 1990, Charles founded the Institute of Justice, which was a public interest right-wing law firm that would take on cases against government regulators. And they won many, many cases against them. So Charles would coming at the left from so many angles. And one wonders how the left could even counter all of this. Again, the Charles and David liked to be influential under the radar. They didn't really want to be seen doing this. So they were very anonymous, uh, as anonymous as they could be. No one really knew who was behind these foundations, these institutes, as they set forth. Now, Charles also wanted to um, create a um, academic beachhead, and he chose uh, George Mason University to pump all of his money into as a turn it into a conser uh, conservative university. The economics department became known for their conservative views. And in 1986, James Buchanan, an economics professor at George Mason was awarded the Nobel Prize in economics, showing a kind of uh, credibility of the conservative view in economics and it put the school and libertarianism on the map. By 2015, the Charles Koch Foundation was subsidizing pro-business, anti-regulatory, and anti-tax programs in 307 different institutions of higher education in America. Then Charles and David set out to launch their private political sales force with a nonprofit called the Citizens for a Sound economy. And again, they kept it hidden. Nobody knew it was them. Uh, it would be a new weapon of business, essentially a fake populist movement secretly manufactured by corporate sponsors. 
The group would be composed of housewives, farmers, small business people, uh, and their mission was to take the right wing ideas and translate them for mass America. To that end, in the early 90s, CSE was putting a lot of advertisements on TV and staging a lot of media events, like they staged a grassroots anti-tax rally that helped defeat Clinton's proposed tax on energy. So they did a lot of that kind of stuff. Then the Cokes created a new nonprofit advocacy group called the Americans for Prosperity, the AFP. And again, the donations could be written off and the names could be kept secret. And the group could participate in electoral politics. In 2009, one month after Obama was sworn in, the Tea Party began to take shape. The Koch think tanks, the Cato Institute, the Heritage Fund, and the Hoover Institute at Stanford began cranking out research papers, press releases, and op-eds opposing Obama's stimulus plan. Fox News and Rush Limbaugh joined the fight. TV networks were now paid millions of dollars a year by the Heritage Foundation to push the Koch brothers' ideas. So money is coming from every direction. Freedom Works, a tax-exempt Tea Party organization funded by Charles Koch, paid Glenn Beck, the Fox News host, over $1 million a year to blend embedded content <clears throat> written by Freedom Works staff seamlessly into his monologue, making it sound as if it was his own opinion. The impact was historic. Glenn Beck's show is what created the Tea Party movement, says Frank Luntz. Now, Randy Kendrick is a lawyer who is married to Earl Ken Kendrick, one of the owners of the Arizona Arizona Diamondbacks baseball team. The Kendricks were charter members of the Coke Network having given millions to the cause. Now, Randy Kendrick went after Obama's Affordable Care Act with a vengeance. She described the act as a socialist takeover of the US government. And she reached out to Sean Noble, a political operative, from her state for help. They formed the Center to Protect Patients' Rights, the CPPR. So here they're gonna be protecting patients' rights, but they basically were giving $100 million to support private health insurance companies who don't seem to care too much about patients' rights. From 2005 to 2008, the Koch's poured $558 million into a massive campaign to manipulate and mislead the public about the threat posed by climate change. All of the Coates organizations tore into global warming. James Ihoff, a Republican Senator from Oklahoma proclaimed Global warming is the greatest hoax ever perpetrated on the American people. Rush Limbaugh said, it's not about saving the planet, it's about raising taxes. And Glenn Beck said, climate change is really only about the government controlling every part of your life, even taking a shower. When the climate legislation bill was defeated, Al Gore said, the influence of these special interests is now at an extremely unhealthy level. Now, another very influential member of the Koch Network is Richard DeVos from Grand Rapids, Michigan, the founder of the Amway Corporation, an $11 billion company. Now, the divorces are devout, reformed Calvinists, 
a religion that is firmly against abortion, homosexuality, feminism, and modern science. What are they for, you may ask. They strongly believe in hard work, free markets, and no government intervention. Now, the DeVosses gave generously to the Koch network. Now, when Dick DeVos Jr. took over the company, he married Betsy Prince, the daughter of a billionaire. She became De Betsy DeVos, who we remember was Donald Trump's Secretary of Education. Now, Betsy and Dick DeVos have a passion, and that is eradicating restraints on public campaign spending. To that end, Betsy founded the James Madison Center for Public Speech in 1997. The goal of this nonprofit was to end all legal restrictions on spending money in politics. So we all know that on January 21st, 2010, the Supreme Court announced its five to four decision in the Citizens United case, allowing corporations for the first time to give unlimited amounts of money to political campaigns. But unbeknownst to many of us, this momentous court decision had its beginnings with Dick and Betsy DeVos 10 years earlier. Jim Bopp, B-O-P-P, the, was the attorney for their, the DeVos's Madison Center. And he had a 10-year plan to take these campaign spending laws down. And what uh, Bob would do is he'd look for cases that he thought if he could sue and move them, they might get to the Supreme Court and might change policy. And he finally got the case that he wanted. And this case centered on a nonprofit called Citizens United, right? And Citizens United had produced a movie. It was called Hillary the Movie. And it was a Hillary Clinton, well, let me say, it was an anti-Hillary Clinton campaign movie. However, federal election law at that time, uh, you could not air a movie like that. Corporations and associations during elections could not air political films. So Jim Bob saw an opening. He sued the Federal Election Commission. And as the years ticked by, it arrived at the Supreme Court and we know their decision decided in favor of the Jim Bob and the DeVos family. So here's this momentous decision that influences all of America, but it really was the personal brainstorm of Dick and Betsy DeVos. Uh, so we know now that the Supreme Court said that limiting a corporation's ability to spend spend money in a campaign is unconstitutional. Uh, quite, quite a change. Citizens United unshackled the big money, says David Axelrod. On March 21st, 2010, Obamacare was passed. This jolted the Republicans to try to take back the majority. Sean Noble, Charles and David Koch, Rich Fink, Randy Kendrick, and others planned the strategy to take back the House. Money was dispersed for 64 upcoming elections in accordance with each candidate's odds for winning. Attack ads would be aired in all the races. Money was channeled into an endless amount of local state legislature races and furtive, well-coordinated projects to take back the governorships of Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, and North Carolina. Attack ads and mass mailings went on 
day in and day out. On November 2nd, 2010, the Democrats suffered great losses in the midterm elections. The Republicans gained 63 seats in the House, six in the Senate, and gained 675 state legislature seats across the country. And this was Charles Koch's genius, was working at this grassroots level and changing these state legislatures. The Republicans now had four times as many districts as the Democrats to gerrymander. And gerrymandering was a central part of the conservative strategy, redistricting to their advantage. And so on January 5th, 2011, Nancy Pelosi hands over the gavel to her successor, the new House Majority Leader, John Boehner. And need I say more, David Koch is in Boehner's office to help celebrate the moment. The LA Times headline read, Koch brothers now at heart of GOP power. I think that banner headline says everything you need to know about the success of the Koch brothers mission. But there was one thing eating away at Charles Koch. He was obsessed with one thing and one thing only, and that was beating Obama in the next presidential election. He called it the mother of all wars. To that end, 300 donors came to his next donor dinner, including nine billionaires, Charles Schwab, was one of them and Ken Griffin from Illinois was there, Dick DeVos, John Menard from owner of Menards was there. And they quickly raised $250 million at that dinner. And Mitt Romney, as we know, was selected as the nominee the Koch brothers seemed to be okay with him. And things were actually moving along pretty well for Romney until, if you recall, there was that expose that caught him saying to a group of wealthy Republicans at a fundraiser, Romney said that the lower 47% of the population were not people he was concerned with. Romney said that they were dependent on government. They believed they were victims. They believed the government had a responsibility to care for them. Romney said they believe they are entitled to health care, food, and to housing. And these people, Romney said, pay no taxes. They were a nation of moochers, he said. Anyway, Things started to go downhill for Romney after he was exposed saying that. But by election day, the Koch brothers and their network had spent $407 million to defeat Obama. So you can well imagine how painful it was when Obama was reelected. But Charles didn't skip a beat. He immediately sent out an email to his donor network, scheduling a meeting to analyze <clears throat> what went wrong. It was hard to keep Charles Koch down and from moving forward. The Republicans have killed us at all this stuff, said Steve Rosenthal, a Democratic strategist referring to the Koch brothers' strategies. In 2010 and 2014, you know, it's like the Democrats, they kind of knew what was going on, but they couldn't sort of figure out a way to counter it. In 2010 and 2014, elections cost the Democrats more than 900 state legislature seats and 11 governorships. 
Charles and David Koch have come a long way <clears throat> since 1975, building and <clears throat> financing a behind the scenes private political machine that crippled the Democrats and began to supplant the traditional Republican party. Educational institutes and think tanks promote their worldview. Their nonprofit groups mobilize public opinion. Congressmen, senators, and presidential hopefuls flock to their secret seminars, hoping to get their support. In the 45 years or so since they embarked on their goal to turn the country to the right, Charles Koch, along with David, could feel a sense of great accomplishment and satisfaction. In an interview with USA Today, Charles Koch said that all he wants is to increase well being in society. He bristles at the idea that he's doing everything just for money. Now, Charles and David never supported Donald Trump, they were always at odds with him. They had a war of words throughout all the years, except people are suspicious because what the Cokes wanted, lower taxes, less regulations, uh, a, a right leaning court, they got everything they wanted during Trump's time. So people are a little suspicious about the kind of joining back and forth between them. Um, Charles has come out with a book. It's called Believe in People. And he says in that book, there's a quote, he says, boy, did we screw up. He says he'd like to collaborate with Biden and Harris on finding ways to work with them to break down barriers, holding people back, including criminal justice and immigration reform. Charles was sickened by the insurrection at the Capitol. He wants nothing more to do with Trump, even though he never had much. So is he softening? He certainly is a extreme doctrinaire conservative, so we will have to wait and see what the future brings. So anyway, thank you. Thank you for listening. And let me turn it back to Peg.